Ich bin endlich, kann ich so hier. Good morning. Let's take our hymnals and turn to hymn number 33. Hymn number 33. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's all stand and sing praises to our Lord. We'll do all four verses. Y'all sing out this morning. Thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning, Lord. I'm, what a wonderful day this is, Lord, as we recognize thy son's triumph over death, Lord, that through him we might find favor in thy sight. I am so thankful for that, Lord. I, I pray that today, Lord, that you would just work through all of us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just have its perfect will this morning, that you would bless the message, Lord, that it may, it may impart upon us, Lord, what we need to hear, and that you'd be with all the music this morning, Lord, that we might praise your name for how excellent it is. And I ask all of these things in thy son's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, good morning. This is uh, Resurrection Day. Amen. This, this is a great day on the Christian calendar, is it not? But you know, the wonderful thing about uh, having a risen Christ is that uh, every day on the Christian calendar is a great day. So, but we're glad that you're here. You've done the right thing, honoring the Lord by your presence in the house of God today. We're just glad to see all of you that are here, those of you that are viewing us online. Uh, we're excited to have you with us as well. I have just uh, a couple of announcements. There are several more in the bulletin, but I don't want to take the time, the time to read through all those, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, one of our missionaries, uh, a missionary family to the Philippines, Brother Joel and his wife Sarah Arnold will be here with us tonight at the 6 o'clock hour, so we hope that you'll be here for that. And then our spring revival will soon be upon us. Uh, a brother that we love to death, Brother Byron Fox, is going to be here from May the 16th uh, through the 19th, so it'll be kind of a Sunday to Wednesday meeting at that time. Um, before I finish, I'd just like to say, too, we have a couple of new 
guest here with us today. I think one's been here before uh, some time ago, but uh, Brother Bill get, uh, Gregory uh, behind the Kiners there, a little bit further back in the uh, light blue shirt is uh, Kevin Rhodes. And we're just glad to have these two gentlemen are here with us today. I got to pick on you, Bill, a little bit. Bill lives, lives over in Bexley. He told me he lived in the poor section of Bexley. I've been all through Bexley, and I, I didn't know they had a poor section. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, if you want to trade houses, I'll be glad to trade with you. I'd love to live in the poor section of Bexley. There <laughs> but anyway, good to have Bill and uh, Kevin here with us today. Uh, that'll do it for the announcements, but make sure that you read them all. They're very important. All right. I'm sorry, I thought the pastor was preaching then we were doing the second song. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Just take your animals and turn to uh just take the bolts and it, it, it is. Yes, I think Pastor, I think he was supposed to go ahead and preach at this time. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> hey, I'm used to making mistakes. I thought I I should have read the bulletin. <laughs> like I told you to do. <laughs> Don't do as I do, just do as I say. <laughs> How's that for leadership? <laughs> Oh, me. Well, <clears throat> this will be a real challenge for me uh, because I have to be short and concise today. Uh, we'll see how that works out. But I have, uh, I've got it down to five pages of notes. Usually it's about 10 or 11, so hopefully the sermon will be about half the normal time. Because we've got a... Uh, an Easter program, about 30 minutes long, and I'm really looking forward to sitting back and being edified by that. But you know, today we, and I don't need to tell you this, but we celebrate Easter. And our Jewish, Jewish friends are also celebrating a great event at this particular time. It's the Passover season. And, uh, but, you know, as I thought about these two celebrations, there's one great difference that became very obvious to me. You know, though Moses led the uh, Israelites out of Egypt, there is no Jew today, nor has there ever been one, who has claimed to be in contact with the living Moses. But Christians can claim that they live day to day in close contact with the very same Jesus who arose from the dead. 1988 years ago, and that seems to me on a practical level to be the greatest message of Easter. The fact that we have a relationship, and uh, turn me down just a little bit, Brother Colt, thank you. The fact that we have a, a living relationship with a living Lord, uh, that excites me, and it excites you as well. That's why we're here today to celebrate this great day. Yeah. I think the most wonderful privilege any human being can have is that we should be given the honor of having a divine companion all the way through life, day by day. Mm. And that means everything to me. <clears throat> Yet it seems to be one of the most neglected privileges today. You know, I do understand it, it uh, uh, because I've, I've often myself neglected that relationship with my Lord, I'm sad to say. The greatest provision ever made by God, if you stop and think about it, to handle pressure and uh, hard times and dangers and disappointments uh, uh, seems to be the last resort for many Christians as far as uh, drawing close to the Savior who, who can help us with all those things. And they apparently prefer to spend, and this is what people do today, they uh, spend thousands of dollars in counseling and psychiatry bills or battle with fears and worries for years on end or even blow out their brains. Uh, you know, we're told in the Word of God in the prophetical passages that uh, in, in the latter days men's hearts will be failing them for fear. 
Well, none of that is necessary if they have a close, living, vibrant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And yet, folks, how often do we take that relationship for granted? I really want you to stop and think about that this morning. How intimate is your communion uh, with the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? I am reminded of the book of Isaiah 26, 3, that thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. I mean, I, I, I want to stop and say, myself included, it's only a rare few among, among God's people that experience on a consistent level perfect peace. And if you think of being too extreme uh, and, and too cruel that statement, I, I, I want you to consider something. Do you still worry about things at times? Are you still upset about things at times? Are you still bothered by things at times? Do you get bent out of shape at times? Let me tell you, folks, the reason why we do is because we still do not have perfect peace. And if we've got perfect peace, if, you, if you've got perfect peace and can maintain it till the day you die, you'll never worry again. That's what a relationship with the risen Christ can do for us. The problem is... As human beings, and we still have to live in this sinful flesh, though we've been redeemed and have been given the divine nature as well, we still have the old nature. And none of us stay our minds upon the Lord all the time. But how much life better would be if we would do just that? I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul's word of advice. He was writing to a young man. Uh, while in a prison cell in Rome, Paul was writing to a young man who had been left alone in a pagan city to face the battles of the Christian life. And this is noteworthy because he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. He said, remember that Jesus Christ, the seed, uh, Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Now, Timothy, you are got to go through some tough times, so if I can give you a word of advice, this is it. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of, of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel. And it seems to me that that one verse is a pattern for handling difficulties in life. Again, remember, remember, the next time... You're faced with a challenge that you, you feel like you cannot possibly overcome. I want you to remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and he's there to help. Um, so that's the gospel that Paul preached. I suggest that that is the message we need to hear again on Easter Sunday, and indeed uh, on many other days, but especially today, because it is a message we seem to forget so easily. If Christians took Paul's advice, remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, some wonderful things would happen. And the first one is this. I've been thinking about this. Uh, if, if we truly had a real, living, close, intimate relationship with Christ, there would be no need for counseling among Christians. Pastors wouldn't need to counsel uh, the lay people anymore. Pastors wouldn't need to be counseled. Uh, anymore, because Jesus is the divine counselor. He is the divine companion who is able to meet all of our needs. And if we took the, this truth seriously, it would enable us to experience immediate victories over things like lust and uh, alcoholism and drug addiction and explosive tempers, uh, the use of sharp, caustic words. Uh, morbid fears, feeling uh, guilty about things, smug and self-righteous complacency. God and Jesus Christ would take it all away. We would be delivered from loneliness and, and greed and jealousy and emptiness and restlessness if we would just stop to remember that every day Jesus Christ was risen from the dead uh, according to Paul's gospel. So when you start your day tomorrow, who are you going to talk to first? Who, who, who are you going to get in touch with first? Who are you going to make sure 
because you're in fellowship with him, uh, make sure that uh, who, who's going to walk with you that day to come tomorrow. It needs to be Jesus Christ. You see, this is one of the big reasons why Christ came into the world. We would be a lot more wholesome and a lot more well-adjusted and well-balanced. We'd be more loving as the people of God uh, and able to cope with life no matter what it brought if we just walked with Jesus. I've been machine gunning, but see, that is the privilege that we have. It is only because Jesus Christ did rise uh, what some 18, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. It, it's because that Jesus did rise from the dead that we can walk with him. And we're commanded to do so in Scripture. You know, when, you, when I stand up here and talk to you about all the things that Jesus Christ can do for you and how he can transform you, how he can bless you, how he can make you a much better person, how he can make you more like God instead of more like the ungodly. Are all these exaggerations that I'm talking about? Not if we judge from the testimony of Christians in the scriptures and uh, others through history. I want you to remember what Paul once wrote in Philippians 4.11. He says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I, I don't know how an unsaved man can even say that in the world today. And I'll tell you what, if you look at the unsaved crowd, and if you look at uh, that group uh, up there in Washington, D.C., I, I see a lot of discontented people. When I consider the can cancel culture, when I consider uh, the woke crowd, uh, when I consider the leftists and the progressives, these are angry people. They're not content at all. And one difference between us and the world's crowd is that the world's crowd is clamoring for their rights to be met, and God's crowd should be clamoring for their rights rather than ours to be met. It's a whole different mindset. <laughs> We think more highly of others, as Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, than we do ourselves. And so we shouldn't be out there as discontented people griping and complaining about what we don't have. It, it should be, my friend, what can I do for you? How can I help you? I defer to you. If everybody, saved and unsaved, had that kind of an attitude in America today, America would be almost heaven on earth as far as a country to live in. But that's not the way it is. People are discontented because they are disconnected from the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul could say, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. He goes on uh, to say in Philippians 4.12, and I mean, this is the secret of Paul's contentment. He says, I know how both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Well, if you found yourself empty, if you found yourself hungry, if you found su uh, you, to be uh, suffering need, would you have perfect peace? Go back to Isaiah 26. I don't think most of us would. But Paul had that perfect peace. Because his mind was stayed upon the risen Lord and he walked with him on a daily basis. I challenge you to do the same. I, I don't know, folks. Y'all listen to me so much. You've heard me preach so many times. You, you can get immune to it. Um, and it, after all, it's, it's not me that's uh, special in any way, but the Word of God remains very special. And I preach the Word of God. You really need to sit up and, and heed and take notice and listen. I mean, overnight, if you would seek to draw nigh unto Jesus Christ, he would draw nigh unto you. In life, your quality of living would go way up in a matter of a few hours. That's what I'm talking about. That's what it means to have a risen Savior. 
And, uh, you know, with Paul, whether he had what he needed or had nothing at all, he knew how to be content. And he tells us uh, what, the, what the secret is in Philippians 4, 13, one verse later. He says, I can do all things. <laughs> I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So sometimes I'm on the mountain, sometimes I have to walk through the valley, through the shadow of death, but he goes with me, and because of that, I can do all things. Yes. See, Paul was able to get to that place where he said, God, it's not important what I want. What do you want? And Paul even came to the place in life that few Christians ever get to where he can honestly say, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You folks, you just want to keep on living as long as you can. If I had my way, I'd go today. That's how you feel when you get really, really close to the risen Savior. Because there is no relationship that can compete in that relationship that a person has with Jesus Christ. Amen. Not if you've ever really had it. There's nothing to compete with that. Nothing. The, uh, Paul wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 1.29. He said, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Man, I, that's, that's the kind of life I want to have. The Apostle Paul wrote to Peter, uh, wrote in, uh, I'm all confused here. The Apostle, not Paul, but the Apostle Peter wrote, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. See, this is what happens when I try to rush through a sermon. And <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the clock here, and I got, and I, it's, uh, it's sinful if I don't finish the sermon. Okay, so I've got to finish, and I've got to keep rolling. But he wrote in 2 Peter 1, 3, he says, His, defi his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So with our relationship uh, with the risen Lord, we have everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. The writer of Hebrews said, let us run with uh, uh, patience the race that is set before us. That is the race of life itself, day after day, step after step after step. And then he says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Do you need faith to motivate you? To strengthen you to do what must be done? That's what Jesus is here for. Yes. Kind of interesting that uh, David Livingston, he found that motivation to be a very real missionary to Africa back in the 1800s. He said, uh, he said this, he said, I go through the jungles of Africa and Jesus is by my side. And that made all the difference for David Livingston. I don't know if you ever, ever heard of a man by the name of Savannarola, but he was a 12th century evangelist in Florence, Italy, and he said this. He said, they may kill me, they may tear me in pieces, but never, never, never shall they tear from my heart the living Jesus. <laughs> Glory, man. I like that. I, I get fired up just reading that. Samuel Rutherford, one of the great Scottish Covenanters, was put in jail for his faith in the 17th century. And he said, Jesus Christ came into my cell yesterday and every stone shone like a jewel. You know, I, I, I'm very careful about sensationalism and things like that. But I believe in the past there have been people that have been so close to God that they've experienced some things that we in a lifetime will never experience. I remember when D.L. Moody was rebuked for his lack of power as an evangelist early in his ministry. And, uh, and, and the conviction of the Holy Ghost came upon him and he went into an upstairs room for about three days. And uh, with just a little bit of water to drink, and he prayed straight for three days. And he said, at first it seemed like the heavens were brass and I couldn't get through, but I stayed there and persisted in prayer. 
And finally, the clouds began to break, and then the full light of the glory of God shone through. And after about three days of praying, he said he woke up uh, from his time of prayer and looked around, and it seemed like the walls were literally on fire. The presence of God was there with D.L. Moody. And folks, we have the privilege of Christ's presence to go with us every day if that's what we really want. Yes. But God said, you know what? You're really not going to find me until you search for me with all your heart. You can't, you can't half-hearted effort won't get it, man. And that's why many Christians today are not more fascinated with Christ and Christianity than they are right now. Because we haven't yet searched for God with all of our heart. It's time we did that, saints of God, today. I mean, our faithfulness should go from down here to way up here overnight if we're serious about finding a relationship with a risen Savior. <clears throat> you know, I think sometimes we just think of Jesus Christ as some kind of a genie in the, in the magic lamp of our desire that we can rub and there he is to meet our needs but no we're here to serve but if we serve and if we and if we sow we shall reap a hundredfold and uh there's one other thing i want to just share with you before i close there's a great truth that gathers around the resurrection and that is the resurrection is indeed the answer and I like this. It's the answer to the hopelessness of death. It is the breakthrough that has brought us out of grief and terror and fear and despair in the face of death and the hope and joy and peace in the moment of our dying. You know, many can testify to that. We witness to it every Easter. It is as the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, the resurrection of Christ is the guarantee of our faith. We have a hope, but it's not like the hope of the world. We have a sure hope. We have a sure hope of heaven. We have a sure hope of eternal blessing. All because our Savior lives today. It is our guarantee. When moments of doubt Seeds, and we wonder if we have been tricked by it all, that this whole Christian thing is some kind of a psychological gimmick designed to make us feel good while we pass through life. So we'll just go back to the inescapable fact that Jesus rose from the dead and did it in the presence of many witnesses, over 500 to be exact, so that it was established beyond uh, a doubt so that even his enemies, if you read the end of Matthew, they couldn't even deny it. They knew Jesus had risen from the dead. If we could just embrace that, we could go through faith uh, and uh, we could go through our faith with a life of peace and rest. Everything rests on that great fact that Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection, you know, is a great comfort in times of bereavement when we have to say goodbye to a loved one. Um, we had to say goodbye to Juanita Custolo just uh, three days ago here at Calvary Baptist Church. And uh, Cindy, uh, one of our church members, uh, Ben and Sauer, her daughter, was obviously in attendance. Uh, from everything I know, Juanita had professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as a young lady. You know, Cindy was able to walk away from the grave that day reminding herself that she would see her mother once again. But why? How? Because Jesus Christ is the first fruits from the dead. Yes. And let me tell you what, because he rose from the dead, it's just a matter of time before many of us follow. Hallelujah. 
What a Savior. I, uh, I need to quit, but let me just close with this prayer written by the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 to 21, this is what he said. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, hallelujah. What a Savior. Take our hymnals once again and turn to hymn number 180. Hymn number 180, what we'll do, we're going to sing all three verses back to back and then we'll do the chorus on those songs. Hymn number 180, if you'll stand, we'll sing all three verses, y'all sing out. chosen, they went throughout the cities and the villages, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And I, and, and along with Joanna and Susanna and others that Jesus had healed, we all ministered to the needs of this band of men out of the resources that we had. What incredible love this man showed to all those that he taught. All the words and all the deeds he did glorified, glorified God Almighty. He was driven by a deep love, an obedient love, a love for God, a love for people, all people. 
My affliction was not on purpose. It wasn't something that I wanted to happen to me. So I understood his compassion and his love for me. But these men were intentionally, joyfully mocking him, willingly torturing him, killing him unjustly. And he says, forgive? At that point, I knew that his love was sacred and it could not be measured even against the depth of the ocean. And finally, I heard him cry out, it is finished. And then he died. I somehow sensed that these soldiers hadn't taken his life. But as he cried out, he gave up his life, yielding up his spirit when the time was right. The love that led him to that cross is a love that I know will never let me go, even though he's gone.
gone. How is it possible? These are my first thoughts this morning. The events of the past three days have been remarkable. Where do I even begin? When Jesus died, there was a darkness in our hearts to be sure, but there was literal darkness. The sun was hidden and it was dark. And there was an earthquake. I thought surely the wrath of God was upon us all. But after a while, it was light again. And the soldiers went about emptying the crosses of their victims. But thankfully, Joseph of Arimathea claimed the body of Jesus. He had his lifeless form wrapped in a linen shroud and took him to a tomb that had never been used. And we followed. I looked at Jesus' mother Mary as the men disappeared into the sepulcher carrying her son's body. And she was grieving, but she was grateful that her son had been claimed for a proper burial. Yet we could not make his burial completely proper. Shabbat would begin soon and we had no time to gather what we needed and then return to anoint his body before sundown. So we returned home and gathered the spices and ointments that we needed just barely finishing our task before sundown. Now we would wait until the earliest permissible time when Shabbat ended so we could go and anoint the body of Jesus. We had served him in his life and we wanted desperately to honor him in his death, but we still couldn't believe Then early, very early, that first day of the week, all of us rose, and we hurried to the grave with our spices and with our oils. It was the third day since Jesus had died. And as we neared the site, it happened again, an earthquake. And we stopped to steady ourselves, and, and then we continued on picking up our pace. And then I wondered, had the tomb been compromised inside with its precious and when we reached the tomb, well, I can't, I can't express our surprise. The stone that once covered the entrance of the tomb had been, well, it was set aside. It, it was rolled away from the entrance. The earthquake had apparently been strong here. This is a blessing from Yahweh. He's moved the stone for us, I said. And then... Then I became anxious about the inside of the tomb. And there at the entrance, we stopped cold, for there was a glorious being that began speaking to us. And he was asking us why we were seeking the living among the dead. He told us Jesus wasn't here. He said he had risen from the dead, just as Jesus told us.
wasn't there. He's gone, gone. I did not want to hear this being spoken again. How can we take the loss of him twice? Conspiracy. Someone surely has taken him. I began to cry. My heart was breaking again. My Savior was gone again. And then through my tears, I saw the gardener. Surely he would know what happened to Jesus' body. Please. I was crying almost uncontrollably, uncontrollably begging the gardener, please. If you've taken his body and hidden it somewhere, tell me where and I will take care of him. And then... me with one word. He spoke my name, Mary. At that moment, the storm that raged in my soul suddenly ceased. The storm of confusion. The storm of trying to reconcile his death with the expectation of what I thought a Messiah was going to do. The storm of utter grief and overwhelming sadness. It all ceased when he spoke my name. I came to his tomb, a grieving, confused little lamb, and I heard my shepherd's voice, and it was unmistakable that it was Jesus, whom I thought was dead. We'd come to anoint his body, and here he stood before me with love and gladness shining on his face, and oh, that smile. It all made sense. Messiah has risen just as he'd been telling us all along. All I could utter was, Rabboni. If he hadn't stopped me, I would have hugged him for days. I was so over, overcome with joy and wonder at the sight of the one who loved me so much that he would endure hatred and torture and death and was powerful enough to conquer death Oh, what a wondrous, wondrous love he has. But now that he's risen, I've got work to do. I need to tell everyone that Jesus is risen, that he's alive. You know, he speaks your name too, friend. Accept the reality of his love. He changed my life with that love. And he'll change your life too.
And Jesus said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Thank you. 